Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Alumni Career Pathways Series is a collaboration presented by the Alumni Relations and Career Development and Work Integrated Learning Offices. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that this panel is being moderated on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salotooth peoples, who are the rightful protectors and guardians of this land, marked on a map by Vancouver. To introduce myself, my name is Sara Malchen. I'm an artist here in Vancouver, where my work dissects private and public disclosure in parasocial relationships. I represent the Alumni Relations Office here at Emily Carr University, and I am an alum myself graduating in 2015 with a BFA in Visual Arts. The Alumni Career Pathways series has been created in collaboration, and through these panels, we hope to demystify different career paths for both current students and early career alumni. Tonight's panel highlights film and the multiple career pathways available to filmmakers, animators, and artists who are working with moving art. This panel is being recorded and will be available to watch after on the leeway.ca under resources. The leeway is the social and professional networking site available to all Emily Carr University community members Students who sign up to the platform between now and the end of reading week will be entered to win an Opus gift card. At the end of the series, all episodes will be available on Artswork, the Student and Alumni Job Board, as well as the alumni website at ecuaa.ca. I'm delighted to introduce Shannon McKinnon, Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning. The Career Development and Work Integrated Learning Office works with alumni and students to assist them with their professional development through one-on-one -on -one advising sessions and co-curricular activities. Shannon will be moderating tonight's panel and introducing our panelists. Over to you, Shannon. Okay, thank you and good evening. And that was a lovely introduction. Sorry, my cats just jumped up on here. <laughs> so uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, this evening, we have an amazing panel comprised of alumni here to talk about the career pathways and professional journeys in film. But before we dive into the uh, into panel introductions, uh, I've, we're going to launch a quick poll just to find out how many of you are students, alumni, and faculty, just so we can have a better understanding of who you are and what our audience is comprised of. Um, so Sarah will uh, launch that, and she can let us know what the results are once it's done. What's your cat's name, by the way? His name is Raj. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's a big cat, 17 pounds. I hope you see them. We, oh, yeah. I'll go get them. Just hold on. While we're waiting for the poll, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Here's the cat. Oh, hi, oh wow. That's my Raj. Oh. Wow. <laughs> he's like, get out of here. <laughs> Did the poll work, Sara? Hmm. Oh. There we go. Okay. So it looks like we're 50% uh, here, 50-50 almost. Um, okay. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll then, okay, Sara? Okay, so um, just sharing the results there. And hopefully we get some more uh, students in here. <laughs> so, 
Uh, all right, so it looks like there's eight students, one faculty and six alumni, <laughs> including the alum not including the alumni that are here. Or is it <laughs> all those six alumni? <laughs> all right. Um, just give me one second. I don't know what happened to this. Okay, so moving on. Um, so tonight's format for the panel to give you an idea of what to expect, we'll take a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Tell us what year they graduated and if you would like more information about this evening's panelists, Sarah, Sarah will put a look, post a link into the uh, chat and you can see their bios there. And then this will be followed by a series of topics for discussion. And then lastly, we'll open up the breakout rooms to give you an opportunity to speak directly with panelists. Great, so let's get started with panel introductions. So tonight's panelists are Lawrence Lelam, Brian Nord Stewart, Zorn Drago, Ivan Lee, Cheyenne Rain Legrand. Okay. Um, and so um, how about we start with, um, I'm just gonna go with who, how I read this out. We'll start with Lawrence. Uh, please share an introduction to your current work. Hey, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm Lawrence Lem. I started, uh, I went to Emily Carr in 2011, I believe. First, uh, and actually not in film, I, I was doing, I was kind of dabbling, not really sure what I was doing. I transferred from another program, uh, was, did a little bit of com, I was doing visual arts. And then I took a, like a, a video class and I kind of fell in love with it, just with that process of editing. I uh, graduated in 2016, actually. I kind of like took a, maybe like a year off for my internship. And I just kind of took my time a little bit. And I, um, I, I kind of, became uh, the work that I have been known to do and I like to do are sort of uh, uh, like mostly narrative work, but I also work a lot in documentaries. I like to have a, a foot in both worlds. A lot, mostly uh, my work for money, I edit like documentaries. Um, I did a lot of work out of film school for digital agencies on doc stuff, but my personal work, I, I like to do sort of like music, uh, coming of age or like coming of ages slash dramas in sort of like a music centric world that explores some kind of underground space. Um, and um, yeah, I'm working on my first feature. I got telephone funding for my first feature, uh, which we'll be filming this uh, fall, which I can talk about more later. Congratulations. Thank That's you. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, Brianne. Hello, everybody. I'm Brianne. Um, I went. I graduated Emily Carr in 2009. Um, yeah, I was in the FAVIM program, as it then was called, which was the Film Video Integrated Media. And the work that I started doing at Emily Carr that I'm still doing is scripted comedy. Um, and so far, it's been a lot of coming of age stuff, like Lawrence and. Um, mostly awkward comedies about sex which uh is funny it is but i also do like i just worked on a netflix horror show uh, horror tv series for a year um i was assisting the cinematographer and then occasionally i'll do corporate work if the timing is right or if i'm interested um or I have also worked in the camera department for various um, things as well, which is just helpful when you want money or people around you instead of working by yourself. Great, thanks so much. Um, and uh, Zoran. Hi everyone, Zoran. Uh, I graduated in 1997 and it was called Just Film and Video and um, no, no sign of digital media yet. And uh, ever since um, I've been working on, on different projects uh, in, in, in a spectrum from documentaries to short films, dramas, comedies, and, and, and even music videos. 
And uh, right now um, I'm working on, um, on, on a variety of projects. Uh, one is documentary with Karen Jamison Dance Company, where she's revisiting some of her dances from uh, 24 years ago. It's called Stone Soup. And uh, I'm also the, uh, developing a short um, uh, a drama uh, for an online format. Um, when I, I was talking to, uh, we were in my, my uh, writing and producing partner, Victoria Larimore, uh, we were talking to Quibi, but you know what? Well, you know we we know know what happened with Quibi, and uh, so we're just going to be developing it our, on our own. Uh, just recently, I optioned an uh, upcoming book that's in a print right now by a uh, award-winning Cree writer, Larry Loyal, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, we're planning to make it into a feature film. And just finishing my documentary that I filmed in Costa Rica on. Um, um, a, a really unique and eccentric uh, artist called Beto and the uh, documentary is called Beto Mi Amigo. It's a short format documentary and, uh, and also um, still promoting my uh, feature film that's uh, playing on Amazon Prime and um, at, still at a few other festivals uh, around, uh, around the country. So that's what's keeping me busy lately. Great, thanks. Okay, um, Ivan. Hello, fellow young people. This is Ivan. Uh, I graduated in 2019 in the animation program a year before it was separated into 3D and 2D. So it was just animation in general. And uh, prior to graduation, I've worked in mostly the uh, visual effect department in motion pictures. I've worked on a movie called Sonic the Hedgehog. And the reason why they, they hired our batch is because they, as some of you may know that they they changed they dramatic they dramatically changed the design halfway through and extended the uh the release date so i so i was fortunate enough to get hired at that point and then i went on to work on a movie called cats the musical the movie and eventually the studio shut down and fired every one of us and uh then i went on to work on some uh other movies such uh and tv shows such as the mandalorian the twilight zone season two and uh Currently, I'm working in a visual effects studio and we just finished its a movie called Justice League, the Snyder Cut. Yeah, that's pretty much I'm, I'm do doing for studio work. And when it comes to personal work, I primarily focus on uh, 3D animation and occasionally I, I might make some live action film if I feel like it. That's great, thank you. Uh, and last but not least, Cheyenne. Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Cheyenne. Um, I'm from Big Stone Cree Nation. I uh, currently reside in Edmonton. Um, so I'm kind of unique to this group because I started out as a visual artist at Emily Carr. Um, and then I kind of, my work organically became video. I do performance uh, a lot, which that becomes like a video. Um, I also work in sound. Um, so I work pretty interdisciplinary uh, and usually my video work uh, ends up becoming like installations. Um, so I graduated in 2019 and my grad piece was a four channel uh, wall installation um, that kind of was just addressing what it is to be an indigenous woman. Um, and uh, that was a performance I did with my mother um, in several different locations. Um, after I graduated, I, I actually received the BMO First Art Award for that piece. Um, and then I also did receive the Early Career Development Grant um, to work with a mentor, Rebecca Balmore, who is also a performance artist. Um, currently, I'm working at Latitude 53 here in Edmonton uh, as a curator. So I have many hats. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm curating a show currently about the languages of Treaty 6, um, which will be public work, works, which is really nice because uh, we're in a pandemic. So it'll be really nice to have people access um, the works still. So yeah, it's a little bit about me. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much. Um, okay. Uh, so we'll get into, I, you gave us an introduction of your current work. And some of you also touched a little bit about what you did when you first graduated, and that's the next question. So, um, 
you know, moving through again. So Lawrence, if you could tell us a little bit about, and I know you touched on what you did when you first graduated, but if you could maybe expand on that, tell us about what it was like for you when you first graduated from Emily Carr as a young emerging artist. Mm -hmm. I definitely took advantage of a lot of internships. Um, I actually, I think in my third year, I did an internship um, with a, this social uh, business accelerator and they wanted to make a cool video. And then we shot nine hours of footage and we ended up making like a, a document, a feature length documentary for, for, that we put online for free. Um, and that, I think that's like how I first kind of got into doing more doc stuff and editing. Um, and then in my fourth year, I did an internship with uh, Point Blank Creative, which is like a digital agency that focuses on more like uh, um, values-based clients and organizations and NGOs. And I started to just work, like be their person with that wears many hats or PA their assistant editor, their dit, their person who picks up the gear and drops <laughs> it off and person who picks up uh, coffee and stuff in the morning. So I did that for about, um, I did that for about two and a half years. Um, and at, at the same time, I was still fairly active with my own stuff. And I was fortunate um, in that my, my grad film, uh, I, I think did pretty well and gave me some momentum. It, um, uh, it like kind of had a good festival circuit uh, run where I um, gone to Whistler and and uh, won something there and also like and also like Emily Carr helped with uh, we were part of like the student festival in um, uh, in Montreal I'm blanking so festival of the cinema nouveau mm -hmm. and so like that it just like it because we won some like best student film awards um, that really gave some go good momentum and spotlighted um, my work. And I kind of, I, I, I eventually just tried to ride that wave and I, um, I applied for crazy eights and did a crazy eights. And, um, and I, two years ago um, I did, or 2017, I started to work with uh, Ying Wang, who is, who kind of got me into film in a way of like way back, she started like the film, uh, a little film festival in Richmond. And I volunteered there initially before Emily Carr. And she did her own film that took 10 years and I edited with her uh, from 2017 to 2019. Um, so that's kind of like the more work stuff. I, I enjoy working in the independent doc world and um, that stuff. but. Uh, my, for my personal work, I think like riding the wave of like the different making one short and helping that make the next short, and then um, for talent, talent of uh, telefilm has a talent to watch program. Their micro budget program, the sort of a hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar grant, and you apply with different industry partners. And Crazy Eights was my industry partner um, because I had a good relationship with them, so they helped me they basically like vouch for you. And so they vouch for my pitch, um, which was one of the ones picked last year. Um, so and that's a little quick summary of, uh, of what you've done since you graduated. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So um, uh, we'll have the same question for you, Brian. Uh, tell us about what it was like for you when you first graduated from Emily Carr as a student. Um, so I graduated in 2009 and, um, I had done this short film called, uh, Trolls, which was little kids talking about what doing it means. And it was scripted, um, six and a half minutes. And I ended up going to a ton of film festivals with that film, including, um, this short film festival, called Clermont Ferrand, which is in um, France. And it's um, the biggest film festival in the world. And it's kind of like the can of the short film world. Yeah. And then from there, because I was in that festival, um, 
I got distribution. The distributors sold it to a number of different channels, both in Canada, the US and um, Europe and Africa. And uh, so that was kind of sweet because making money off of a short film is really unheard of. And then mm -hmm. making money off of a student film is probably even more unheard of. Um, and then, so I spent, I think I spent like the summer um, and a couple months kind of just taking a break from school and regrouping, reconnecting with family. And then I started a mentorship program, a paid mentorship program with this company called Anade Productions. And that was um, through like a work employment program with the, what is now called the CMPA, the Canadian Media, Canadian Media Producers Association. So that was a six month contract. And I was working on a documentary series um, about uh, overweight families losing weight and changing their lives together. Um, and what I learned about that was that I never wanted to be a producer's assistant ever again. And that I really was not interested in working in that kind of um, like lifestyle television, um, which was very helpful because um, I probably would have pursued opportunities down that pathway had I not had that experience. And I know that I would have ended up hating it. Um, so then after that, I went on EI, which is uh, awesome. I had never been on EI before. <laughs> I don't think I've been on it since, but it gave me the opportunity to um, create a digital series and film it with a bunch of um, friends and local actors and people that I hadn't previously met. I made another short film. I did more festivals and I, could, and I got more work um, based off of all of those things. And then like Lawrence, I applied for various funding programs. Um, some I got, some I didn't. Um, and then basically spent a decade trying to figure out how to make the work that I love and want to make and also live in Vancouver. Um, and then since then, a couple more scripted digital series later, uh, but I would say probably the, you're going to ask this question soon, but like I started thinking about what I was going to do after I graduated before I even started Emily Carr and like Lawrence, I was doing a ton of co-ops and internships and trying to meet people and get introductions and favors. Yeah. I know both your names. Cause I've worked in co-op for years, like 20 years. And so yeah. I know both your names from, from running that program. So yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, on. my time at Emily Carr was definitely, um, I, I think, I don't know that I was the exception, but I very much was like, this is the way that I want my education to happen. So how do we make that happen? Um, and it was really great that the people at Emily Carr, including yourself, allowed me to do those things while still getting all of the credits and graduating as I was supposed to. So, great. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Zoran. Yes. Um, once, uh, uh, once I was done with Emily Carr, I graduated, I just wanted to fill in the void where I needed to to uh, sharpen up my skills because some things were not offered at Emily Carr and it's especially like getting into the uh, film biz, uh, working in the industry because there are different certifications and, and, and um, uh, training that you need to have for diff different unions. So for example, I was, um, uh, I excelled in, in cinematography so I, I wanted to um, get uh, all the right certifications. So I, I signed up for a Panavision uh, course, which is like, which was offered like in LA, but they also had a, a smaller version in Vancouver. Instead of seven days, it was five days in Vancouver. And then you had um, people from local Panavision office coming in and training you. And then there was people from 669, the union for uh, cinematographers. And so that was my focus at, at, at the moment. The mm -hmm. other thing that's different from um, for what we just heard is that there were no internships. That was like 
in in a, in a mid to late 90s, uh, I graduated in 97, there was not really opportunities for internships where the companies will take you. They were like Rainmaker, which was a digital company doing special effects and, and editing. They offered here and there, depending, but it, because there was a lot of involved training and learning curves. It, so they just kind of, uh, if you go in early, they will, you will get some uh, foot in a door. If you don't, then you just have to learn your stuff and Emily Carter, for example, when I graduated, there was no digital editing. We, um, uh, right after, in 97, 98, Emily Carr acquired first Avid. And that uh, Avid was shared by like, not just film department, but also animation. And there was also a uh, multimedia department and some, some uh, design, uh, communication design students also had access to that. So like the, li the lineup was pretty, pretty big and long. So um, I had to learn that subsequently afterwards and the and also um uh, a focus was do i want to work in the film industry hollywood north was just becoming a big thing uh at 1998 1999 vancouver broke that one billion production budget budget a lot of films are being filmed and and i did my uh, stint in a, in a in a for hollywood north uh industry for about six months but i realized it, it wasn't really fulfilling for me it wasn't creative mm -hmm. uh, I could not express myself everything was like a, like instant soup you know you you you, you mm -hmm. know everything is packaged in LA brought here done nobody likes to hear your input day on the time they just want to shoot and go collect tax credit and go back to LA so with a few of my uh, classmates and colleagues from Emily Carr we decided to stick together and uh, support each other in different projects and so we started like uh, looking for opportunities where we can do our stuff and also some stuff that will make us uh, a, a, an income and where we will be able to support and uh, and also equipment was expensive back then so and so one person had their digital camera I let's say for example I had the lights somebody had microphone and and mm -hmm. it's just a collective on 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 a simpler primitive base but it works it worked for a while and I'm, I'm i'm glad that that was part of that so great hey thanks um and we will continue uh ivan so similar to zoran uh right after graduation i do see the need to sharpen some of the skills that i believe i'm i'm still lagging which is the main mm -hmm. reason why i've joined the uh the visual effect industry and uh, certainly I have my own like and dislike towards the industry. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, there is no creativity involved in, in the visual uh, effect industry. And my position uh, in particularly as a junior artist, you're pretty much just focused on uh, execution in a way. And there is a sad possibility that the current procedure or the current job title that you're holding can be fully replaced in an automated way, like with uh, the advancement of technology. But I do see the need of, uh, getting to know how it at least have a sense about how it feels like because I can see it uh, get benef benefiting my own my own personal work in in a way and yes I from a graduation film I graduated last year at uh, sorry not a year and a half ago at May 2019 and my graduation film is called Finding Uranus it's also a coming of age yeah rom-com movie uh, about Uranus and uh it's an astronomy-ish movie, and it's still going on festival circuit. Uh, it was on, let's see, uh, closer by, it, it's on the Vancouver International Film Festival, Vancouver, Vancouver Asian Film Festival, and also, and also a couple more in, in Ottawa and uh, some, some, a few in Europe. And it's still, it's still going on because, uh, because uh, COVID kind of delayed some of the uh, screening dates. And I've also decided to release it online a little bit uh, early uh, as I expected. And for some reason, it also garners an unexpected, uh, unexpected, let's see, uh, unexpected uh, fo following on, on Vimeo because there's a Vimeo curate, uh, curate, like a programming thing called Short of the Week. They, they saw the film and they, they reposted that. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's, uh, it's fucking hilarious too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I just graduated a year and a half ago, so nothing. Yeah, you're. I know. I was just thinking that too. I know it's the same with that with Cheyenne. It's kind of like okay, you know, when you first graduated two years ago. Um, okay, so and now on to you, Cheyenne. How tell us about when you first graduated from Emily Carr two years ago? Well, when I graduated yesterday from Emily Carr. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, no, I, I, I think one thing I always speak about when I talk about graduating is that it, it, for me, it was a very like scary thing. Like I was very scared of, um, you know, what, what, what's, what's next now? Like I finished school, like yeah. what's going to happen. And in my last year, that's when I decided I was like, okay, I think I need a mentor. Like I don't, I need to know now how, how to make it in this art world. So um, that's when I just reached out to Rebecca Belmore and like began working with her. And then that did extend into the early career development grant. Um, so for me, I think a big part of being out of school was um, being a part of a mentorship, which I found was really helpful and accessing all of that knowledge as well as like that network um, Rebecca had was really great for me. Um, and then I also, while I was doing the early career development grant, I also was working for Capture um, as their curatorial assistant. So I did that. Um, and then partway through Capture, that's when like the pandemic started to hit. So I actually decided to return home. I was planning to return home anyways, because for me in my practice, I'm often like performing with the land or recording the land. And for me, I felt I wanted to be closer to my territory, which is here in Edmonton and in Wabasca, which is four hours up north. Um, so yeah, for me, I, I moved back. And again, that was also very scary because I feel like I had, I had made so much of my roots and connections in Vancouver. And so I was like, okay, what, what's next now? So uh, when I returned, it was really nice. I was really, really welcomed. And I was offered this position at Latitude, um, which has been really great because um, I'm able to like also learn another skill. Like I've never really thought of myself as a curator, um, but I'm also doing that now. So that's really nice. And um, so, yeah, that's my big project right now is like curating uh, these seven public space works. And they're like quite big. Like we received um, funding from the city. So yeah, it's allowed us to make the show quite big. It's gonna be up for six months. Um, and I kind of, cause I work with video and sound, there's like a video in it, um, sound element. And like these parts are gonna be like, you know, the sound will be installed outside. Uh, the, they we're getting like a big video screen um, to kind of put in a window front. And um, our, my main goal right now with Latitude, we're hoping to actually get a screen similar to Grunt Gallery. I don't know if you guys are familiar yeah. with their um, screen. So the Edmonton doesn't have anything like that. So um, that's kind of like one of my big goals is to, um, they're hoping if we can make that happen, then that would be my project for the city is curating that art screen, film screen, whatever. It's like a screen for many different video forms to exist on. So that's like my big end goal. Um, yeah, and then I I think I got the, I'm like trying to look at my CV. I'm like, <laughs> it's been like a short amount of time, but yeah, so, and then I got the VMO First Art Award and that was really lovely because I got to go to Toronto and um, meet other artists and network through that. So yeah, that's kind yeah. of, yeah. yeah. You're doing a lot of amazing things. Thanks so much <laughs> for joining us tonight and telling us about them. Um, okay, so um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna actually rotate it around again. Uh, so starting with, um, with you, uh, Cheyenne, how did you first garner uh, the attention of industry studios or galleries in your case? Um, that's a good question. I feel like for me, I've all, even with, for example, Rebecca Belmore, I've always like have this ability to just like ask. And I feel like that's one thing that um, I've sp spoken about before in panels is that you just like really don't know until you ask and like for me I would you know it's all it's a lot a big part of it is networking and it's like this kind of funny weird weird world to to exist in um but it's kind of about yeah like networking and just really putting yourself out there um one thing I struggle with and I hear a lot of other alumni struggle with is to create work um especially as artists I don't know if it's the same for film but as artists, I know that we struggle to after graduating because, you know, you don't have an assignment that's due. So <laughs> um, really pushing yourself to keep creating and keep putting that work out there. And if you keep doing that, I think that um, 
opportunities will arise. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Ivan. Uh, first garner attention of the industry in the studio. Did I, I think I might accidentally answer that before, but, but uh, basically- <laughs> Yeah, uh, I can do a bit, but if you want to elaborate on it. That would definitely. Be so when I graduated, I submit my graduation film to quite a few local animation festival. Uh, some of, most of them are in Canada because uh, the, the good thing is uh, animation festival tend to be free for uh, admission. Uh, for Canadian student, and I was a student at that time, so I was fortunate, fortunately able to do so. And uh, during one of the screening, uh, they selected one of the festival called Ottawa International Animation Festival. They selected this film as part of the, uh, I think one of a, a watch list thingy that they've decided to promote in a, in a circuit, uh, circuit screening throughout the entire Canada. So a lot of people were able to see this film in a, in a theater setting. And then when, when the, uh, when the uh, COVID situation happened, I decided to upload my film online on a, on a public space, uh, on a public internet spaces and people were able to see that. And this is where the uh, online curation uh, happens. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, uh, Zoran. How did you first get uh, garner the attention of uh, industry or studios or? It it uh, was with with a, with a, definitely with a, gra a graduation film and 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 previous few works. Uh, for example, um, I, I I was I knew that that uh, in in a fourth year I knew that the end is coming and I did not know if I will have the access to all of the equipment and facility as I had access at Emily Carr which I mentioned before, equipment was the big thing. So I, I, I was really prolific. I think I had, I had my grad film, I had my grad video, and I had like three other war pieces of work that were also part of my um, uh, like grad, graduation universe. And so what happened is uh, um, uh, I'm, uh, I really like to strategize in a way of how, how I'm gonna launch something, uh, like the film, the video, that kind of stuff. So I, I, I was looking, and back then there was no, in, like we had the internet, but not that many festivals were listed on online. You had, like, I have, a, I still have the little book, this thick that listed all the festivals. Yeah. And, and, and my advantage was that my folks had a fax machine and I would like stay late at night and fax to all the festivals, asking them for, for the application forms or asking them for any insight information. So in the morning they would, I would just like, sometimes waking up in the middle of the night just to change the paper and then to cut it out and then start filling in the morning and then mailing the VHS tapes. That was the, that was the other thing. So it was just the, 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 the getting my, my, my film, my short films out there and then getting the feedback and then started to uh, garner like uh, uh, attraction there where, where the festivals were screening it. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that was the, that, and then the being associated with the projects afterwards, just like trying to figure out which projects I want to work and be part of. Uh, and I was lucky to be part of the uh, UNICEF uh, project, the orange boxes. And that was the first uh, commercial that played on all the networks in Canada uh, and with their logos, because, uh, you know, BCTV doesn't want to have a CBC logo on something and share it. So, and this was really well done. And we did it with like no budget because it was UNICEF and, but it just uh, the, 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 the feedback afterwards and notoriety was, was great and, and welcome, so. Oh, that's great. Cool. Uh, Brian. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> now we, um, we, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I definitely, post graduating like the biggest attention I got was with my grad film but um like Zoran I was um before I had graduated I, I a friend of the family of mine um suggested that I go to this industry panel and in, at the Victoria Film Festival which was called Springboard and they still do it um so I went and I had burned a bunch of DVDs that had two films that I made 
while I was on exchange in Australia, which was half of my third year and half of my fourth year. Um, (laughs) And so with like one of the the first industry connections that I made doing that was in the city. Um, And there, she was at foundation features and they were doing this film, the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, which was um, Heath Ledger's last film. But I just walked up to her and she was on a panel and I said, oh, I'm a filmmaker. I go to Emily Carr. Here's a DVD of some of my films. And I did this so many times. I don't even, I can't count, but dozens. And I think three people actually ever watched it and emailed me back and she was one of them. Um, And then when I was going around with Trolls, my grad film to festivals, it was the same thing, burning a ton of DVDs, not VHS tapes, but it was DVDs and um, just asking, like Cheyenne said, just asking people to watch my work and doing research about other people so that I could compliment them before I asked them for a favor, which was very helpful. And I highly recommend that everybody do that. I still do that all the time. Um, And, you know, as Cheyenne also said, like keep making work and work with the people that you have around you and like help each other out because those those parts of filmmaking don't change with technology. You still need to have people helping you so that you can make better work. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Lawrence. Yeah, just to kind of um, go into more detail of what I was mentioning before. And uh, Brianne actually reminded me that I, you know, like, I kind of went through the similar process in that um, like the grad film uh, did well like it won an um best student short at whistler and also at the leos but just because it wins the awards doesn't mean people see them it, so like it was even at those festivals it still had to like um I, th- I think i just i can't remember if i used a usb oh no I was, it was just like, i was just collecting cards and i would just like email i would just have like a huge stack of cards at the end of every festival um and email folks uh and sort of try to actually like create a, a report. I think I, I developed a, um, a more genuine way of doing this. I think initially I was just like, just throw the links in everyone's face, um, <laughs> watch the film, you know? But I think at the more like film fests and film festivals and, and networking events, I realized how um, that happens a lot. And it's like having genuine connection and relations with with people in the industry is something that is um important for yourself you know like really uh finding those people that you love the work of and and kind of connecting with them in a genuine way and not just like having a cookie cutter you know like sort of response which i was doing in the beginning um but so winning i think like it was like the Leos and um, I think that helped with my crazy eights application because I had a, applied for crazy eights, which if you don't know, it's like the, one of Vancouver's oldest and largest film competitions. I tried the, uh, a year before I didn't get in and I worked with some, uh, I worked on a, a, fr- a now friends uh, short, Joe McCarthy, and I met a lot of good folks on, on there and, um, which I, I always, you know, recommend working on other people's stuff. Uh, and then I think when I did the crazy eights because of way, how they, what they do it, the way they do it, like with cre- like having the gala and having a lot of industry folks come to the screening, I think that was another, um, it gave a lot of exposure to my work to the industry. Um, and I just kind of, yeah like I said, try to ride the wave. I did a story high a music video edition after that. And um, yeah, B, uh, music videos for BC Creative. And every project was just sort of like a whole thing with like getting it out on, uh, trying to find the biggest splash on some sort of platform online or, or festival and um, just trying to, have people engage with it and um 
yeah, I think it's just kind of been, it's kind of been like a sort of like a similar process to every, to every project, but just trying to like perfect that a little bit every time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I also wanted to say, like, I think like looking at Ivan's work, his short film, I feel like he really, like, if you look at that film, you really like see Ivan's voice. And I, and I kind of looking at other people's work, I feel like when you make like your grad film or a film after, or, you know, whatever piece of work um, after grad, uh, after film school or after art school, um, it's like, it's, I find it's like the most, the stuff that really resonates with people is the stuff that is like, you can really hear the person's voice and it's like, it stands out amongst everything else that you're seeing and, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Okay. I feel like we kind of answered this question. Uh, I'm so I'm going to let anyone who wants to jump in and answer this uh, do it with this question if they feel that they didn't answer it. Uh, so I wanted to piggyback on what Lawrence just said as far okay. as networking and business cards um, and making a genuine connection is that it is really important to make a genuine connection. So something that I started doing when handing out my own business cards was writing on it where I met the person and what we talked about, um, which I would also write on their business card. So if I was the first one to reach out, I would say, hey, we met at the Austin Film Festival at the Irish after party. And we talked about how we both love the band. Okay, go. <laughs> I don't know, something like that where, cause like, otherwise you just have a bunch of cards yeah. that don't have faces on them and you and you often drink a lot of alcohol at festivals or industry events or somebody does so their mog their their moggy is going to be foggy their mind their memory is going to be foggy <laughs> about it um but like i still get emails from people who have turned my business card into filters when they roll joints um because i wrote something funny on the back of it and they remember me because of it that's all there you go and also just That's to a add, genuine connection for sure <laughs> just to riff off that i heard of someone's process of like creating a spreadsheet um where yeah like spread like a spreadsheet of all the contacts and like noting these are the people i want to like stay in touch with and so yeah because there's a lot of people and also networking at those events where you drink and dance are the best way i feel like those are the most uh, the best ways to network when you can have fun with somebody and not just talk business. I agree. <laughs> okay, uh, so the question that I was gonna ask is, uh, so what, it, it, feel free to jump in on this. I'm not gonna ask directly. What helped you to get to where you are uh, and what advice would you have for others if, you, if they want to follow, uh, in a, follow a similar path? So what was influential, effective, on the forefront? Um, for me, and I'm sure anyone who's ever tried to be an artist in some way, um, it's definitely perseverance, which is not easy and persistence. But the other thing that really helps is having a very low cost of living, which is not possible for a lot of people. But um, if what you're doing is really the thing that you want to be doing, spending a bunch of money that you don't have on stuff you don't need is not helpful. Um, and I'm saying that because nobody talks about accounting at art school or budgets or spreadsheets or how to do any of that. Um, do. Oh, do you? <laughs> well, nobody talked to me about it. But like, I know a lot of people who did not get to make their choices based off of what they wanted to do that with their career because they were paying off credit cards or going out for dinner every day or had a great wardrobe or something. But um, it's really hard when you're first starting, like unless you get a full-time job somewhere, which you're working on um, as like crew or tech crew, like it's really hard to um, sustain yourself while creating your own work when you're new. So definitely don't spend money you don't have on shit you don't need and doesn't support your art. There you have it. Uh, does anyone else want to talk about uh, what was influential for them on um, getting them to where they are now and what someone could do to follow a similar path? If I may, Go on. Uh, I would, I would, I can't stress enough. It's focus. It's focus. And then just figuring out what's, what are your best strengths and just like, um, 
pursue that to to be the best in that field and and then help like if you if you're working with some if you're collaborating so like if somebody has their strength as audio and yours is video then then it's like it's there is a synergy right there and and and, and, that, and that's the thing just having focus exactly knowing what you want um i i know not just my classmates, I know people who were also in film and video and after everything was said and done at Emily Carr, they, they either made their career in, in the film in industry or on their own or they just like packed up and gave up on that. And, and mm -hmm. I don't, like, it's just like knowing what you wanna do and what you wanna pursue and what field that is, it's just lighting, audio, camera, and then just going for it, so. Mm -hmm. And you were going to say something, Cheyenne? Yeah, um, I think for me, it was like, apply for everything. Like, I, I apply for grants, apply for shows, apply any calls you see. Like, I think that helps me a lot because you're not going to get them all, but you might get one and that's amazing. And one thing I learned that just this year was um, like the rules or the ways of thinking through being nominated for things. Um, I always thought, you know, it, someone needs to nominate you, but I've, I've learned now that since I've worked for galleries, et cetera, that um, you can actually approach someone to nominate you. <laughs> and that's something I only learned this year. Like, you know, I, luckily I was nominated for some of the things I've gotten, but only this year I was like, oh, that's, that's okay. That's normal to do. So it's like just thinking through different ways of um, getting what you want. Um, you don't need to be nominated. You can ask someone to nominate you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good piece of information for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, just to add to that, yeah. like, it's the same, like, yeah, sort of creating your own opportunities, like asking um, if there's shadowing opportunities or auditing opportunities, or like if there's a direct, a local director in town, it's like, oh, you know, like, would you like to, kind of like Cheyenne what Cheyenne did like asking them to be your mentor or like and yeah um yeah asking asking is well well good well that's good <laughs> mm -hmm. uh okay so um I'm gonna just throw this out here too can uh you share any practical let's uh Zoran can you share any practical demo reel or pitching insight uh, for demo reel, it would be just that's that's your opportunity to showcase your work at its best. So, so all your strengths, all your efforts, all the stuff that you do well, put it in those like three minutes. Uh, attention span these days is no no more than three minutes, so it has to be like kick ass. Doesn't have to be over polished. Doesn't have to be no. the best, but just put all your best. It's like. Uh, skills so that people can see if your strengths are in storytelling if they are in in camera work or if there's there's editing skills or so and for pitching it's like elevator what they call the elevator pitch is like try to condense the the feature length story or a short film story into those three sentences as they say if elevator pitch like as, as, as long as you're taking the elevator and and cho choose your words wisely so uh, so people or, or a person who is listening to you, they, they, they know or they can imagine. Sometimes you, you're talking to people who are not imaginative or creative and, and they're just the money people or they're just on the board to decide which, which project gets the grant. Um, and so it has to, the, the, the word or words have to strike a note so they will know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, Ivan. So uh, unfortunately, none of my pitches worked before. So I'm just going to stick to a uh, practical demo reel. Uh, when it comes to visual effect and animation, practical demo reel, it's fairly straightforward. You're showcasing a very specifically brand of skill. Uh, for, in my case, I, I work in a, a 3D camera tracking department in the visual effect industry. So it's pretty much uh, you know, tracking, like showing, showing how the camera movement works and showing how you apply the, that very specific software that the industry needs into uh into uh into your showreel and if you have some industry experience if you for, like if you're fortunately work on movies that it's a tv show that's already out uh use those because those are those are the most solid experience that you can you can let 
your p- potential employer knows that what you have worked on. Uh, if you have never worked on that before, doesn't uh, don't worry. Uh, some people may say that, hey, uh, I don't really have any access to a shoot uh, like uh, cameras and stuff. I can't really shoot like a, a good quality video footage. Uh, to apply on my visual effect demo reel. There are also a lot of amazing resources and stock footages that can be found on very uh, specific technical forums and, and uh, educational websites as well. So that's pretty much it. Thanks. Uh, Brian. Um, so as I'm in like the scripted um, drama realm or narrative realm, Um, I definitely would say you need to have, I mean, if you're working across multiple formats or genres, you definitely need to have different reels for those different genres. Um, Like I have mostly comedy stuff. So applying, sending somebody a comedy reel is not going to help me if I'm trying to direct on a horror TV show. Um, And you also need to know who you're pitching to. So doing your homework on what those people want or have already done um, is very, very important because if you pitch somebody a show that's like, I don't know, what movie is just coming out? Any movie. (laughs) Bridesmaids. If you pitch somebody the movie Bridesmaids to the people who made Bridesmaids, they're going to say, well, we already made this movie. Why are you pitching this to us? This is not what we're looking for. Um, So that's really important. And, um, and it's not also, it's not easy. Like, um, I've worked with my agents that rep me to try and curate not only like the quick demo reel that looks more like a cinematographer's reel, but also having like complete scenes because like having a flashy reel that says, look at all these cool shots doesn't tell them that I know how to shoot a scene and get all the elements to tell a story in a great way. Um, But then sometimes you don't have enough money to have a million amazing great shots. So you wanna put that super fancy shot that you did in the montage part of the demo reel so that they see it. Um, And you need to keep creating content. I know we already said that, but if you're applying for a job or pitching a film and you haven't made a film in 15 years, you're going to seem less relevant to people. Um, Also creating work gives you an opportunity to remind people that you exist. Um, And so does winning awards. Uh, So like I'm, I just found out today that when when my last short is nominated for an award that at a festival that I did months ago, but um, it's like, it's based in LA and that's great because the people that I just work for, I've been trying to figure out how to say, Hey, I'm still here. I still want you to hire me for your next TV show. Um, and now I get to say cool news that film that you watched and liked is nominated in these two categories. Um, so learn how to brag about yourself, I guess, is also important when pitching and yeah. making demo reels. That's great. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Lawrence. Um, I, I haven't made a demo reel for myself. Um, I kind of, I kind of don't want to, I've seen demo reels be really useful for like cinematographers, uh, as Brian mentioned, and also for editors I I've seen, um, but like not really a demo reel, but like, uh, like Jen, Ip, for example, who edits on, um, I believe she edits on Game of Thrones and if not just the, or the trailer house that makes the trailers for Game of Thrones. Um, and another person like Jen Ip would make these things called basically like the, the movie trailer mashup. But like, if you look up filmography, 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, they're amazing. They're like five minute mashups of movies. And it's all just like an incredible uh, sensorial, just like ecstasy. And it's just like a great display of her editing skills. And also at the same time, um, there's another editor, I'm forgetting his name. He edited like a spec trailer for Fargo season two, which was my favorite f- favorite season of Fargo. But the, it's interesting, like FX, their, the actual trailer wasn't very good. So he went out and just made a cut his own trailer and it was fantastic. And I think he got, he like that gave him some intention and he got, hired for his work from that 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I might, I hope that I can kind of do the same in the sense of like letting my work speak for me. So like the, the work that I did on the doc, that's helped me get some more doc work now. And um, the music videos that I did through Story Hive and Creative BC, I'm using that as like, oh, you know, I want to do a music video for, uh, I want to do a music video for Komodo. I want to do a music video for this, you know, another artist and like using that to pitch myself. Um, and yeah, I, I, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with demo reels, but uh, I think it also can be depend on your, whatever role you're looking for into how, um, like, I like the idea that it stands on its own. And I think like a demo reel is great, but like, you know, like, like the, the trailer or the, I don't know, like, it's nice when it's, it's also like your work can speak for you, but it depends yeah, on the role again. Yeah. What about pitching? What about doing pitching? Um, for pitching, I, I feel like it's great when it's, it, it comes from a, a genuine place and like, it's just not only well prepared and like well written or just like, it just also gives you a piece of yourself like you can see why this filmmaker or this artist or creator is like a perfect fit for the story and the way that the story is told and I think that um yeah I think like for example for example for the crazy eights pitch and also for my uh telephone pitch it because it's kind of uh explores the world of um Asian hip hop, Asian rappers in Richmond. Um, I kind of uh, there. There's a rhythmicality and a sort of like I, I I didn't rap, but I kind of just like I, I, there was a little bit of a maybe like a little bit of a, a slam poem sort of a flair in the way that I delivered the performance. But um, that's just the way that I I I wanted to make it unique and stand out, and um, it was kind of like pitched in rhyme um and so like you know i think i think there's like the words but also how it's delivered and you know like if you can get you know the the atmosphere or the mood you're trying to convey even just in the way that you deliver it or pitch it i think is is also like those are other elements to your other tools to your um that you have yeah okay thanks um shiana i know that I, it's kind of this is different for you because you're not pitching and doing demo reels for your work but um how would you go about um presenting your work say for gallery or what is your advice on that for for portfolios or if you do do some type of um you know real for submission how how do you submit your work um so I guess for video specifically or my performances, I've, um, for me, I feel like what's most effective, I don't know if it's possible in the film world because films are probably a lot longer than my performances, but I have I really think it's most effective to meet people in person. Not possible, I know right now, but um, I think you can create a deeper connection with someone when you are meeting them in person. So often... For example, the reason I'm working for Latitude right now is last summer when I'd come home, I would I contacted all the curators in Edmonton was like, hey, would you like to see my work? Um, and then we would meet in person and I would just show them like small clips from my performances um, and my portfolio in person. And I felt I felt that was the most effective because I mean, it, it got me this job because they remembered me. And then when I was returning, they found out. And then that's that's how I have this position right now. That's so. great advice. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, I think that we've really touched on a lot of it. You guys have been great. I mean, I think you've answered a lot of my questions that I had that I sent you before they were even asked. Uh, but, uh, okay. I'm going to throw this one out here and anyone can answer it. Uh, what experiences have had the most impact on your artistic and professional development? Or, you know what, I'm also going to throw out the second question, which is, uh, tell us about some of your biggest challenges along the way and how you overcame them. Uh, I'd like to say that, um, going to film festivals and, just really getting life, just just 
enjoying and getting life and inspiration from other people's works. I feel like going to um, going to TIFF and going to like it's going to just a bunch of film festivals. You know, like, I think it's just like it's so great to be at film festivals, and I can't wait for that to be a thing again. Um, but even at the virtual film festivals that they have nowadays, it's just it's just great to you know um, enjoy work and get life from that. Um, and I think it's, it can sometimes be as simple as that and just like feeling inspired to be like, you know, I can't wait to do something like that myself. Um, and I, I kind of like answering the other question of overcoming a, a great challenge, but also like answering another question to add, uh, answering another question that you asked earlier. Um, one thing that helped get me to where I am now, um, like, I, with my work as an editor and working with the doc um, that I worked with a filmmaker, Ying Wang, and she had this film that she had been shot for like over 10 years, since 2007, there was so much footage. Um, it's, it was like, it felt like a endless black hole of just like work and there's just like, there's no end on in sight. Um, and I think make, taking care of ourselves mentally, like, doing dance breaks and exercising, meditating in the morning, watching films on our videos on our break and just like keeping in love with film. And, you know, I think it just um, enjoying the struggle, like enjoying finding, I, I think, I think also parts of it's like taking care of yourself by like keeping you, yourself inspired. Like, I think that's, but I would, I would kind of say that's like kind of learning to enjoy that or find some, um, maybe this is more like taking care of yourself but I think like yeah keeping yourself inspired is through other people's work is I think pretty important and uh, yeah does anyone else want to answer that yeah I'll give it a go um, uh, editing my own work has probably contributed a lot to my own professional development because I am the person like direct. So the, the thing that I love doing the, the most and like that all of this is working towards is directing. Um, but in doing that, I have learned to write, I've learned to produce, I've learned to edit. And so I have done almost all of those jobs um, for most of the work that I have created. Um, I've gotten to see people audition for things, which has given me ideas or having people read things and getting feedback. But it all comes down to when you like finally make the film, which is when you're finally editing it and you no longer have the theoretical version of the film that's in your mind. It's what you actually have to make it. Um, and you have to figure out a way to fix your mistakes or like fix something that an actor did on the day or maybe something that you didn't notice and you're fixing other people's mistakes too. Um, but you're also figuring out how to use the things that you didn't plan for or happy accidents. And those can be like the most powerful or meaningful parts of your films are the things that just happened on the day. Um, so that's probably like, as far as like what makes me a better filmmaker mm -hmm. um and then I would say like just as far as like the most impact on my life is like watching probably watching films like you can't how do you be a filmmaker if you're not watching films how do you direct television if you're not watching television um you need to know what's what's happening and what's current yeah. um and like get inspired by it because it's a it's a lot of work and really expensive to do to do this thing so you really better love it <laughs> thanks <laughs> uh, I was gonna say and so what what challenges have you uh, had along the way but I think you kind of stepped and talked about that with money <laughs> so <laughs> well I mean that's a practical one that we never yeah, yeah. that doesn't seem to get addressed like um as Oren was saying like having focus like that's a serious issue is procrastination we all have the different ways yeah. that we procrastinate or we have FOMO the fear of missing out so I could say oh well Lawrence is editing documentaries maybe I'm supposed to be editing documentaries or Cheyenne's doing these installations with her mom maybe I should be working in a more interdisciplinary format as well like you you can you're 
you are your, your best advocate and probably like your worst enemy at the same time, because if you can't figure out how to make the work you want to make, you're not going to excel. Um, and I, I don't know, like that's, that is probably one of the biggest challenges is just like motivating yourself to do the thing or what happens when you've got, when you've done all of the things you're supposed to do and you think, okay, I've, I've directed my first music video, the music videos are supposed to be flooding in, or I've directed my first feature and that's supposed to get me my first gig directing television. If those things don't happen, then what do you do next? Yeah. Like Morgan was saying, oh, I, I graduated from Emily Carr and I won the best student film at the Leo's. Well, I graduated from Emily Carr and I won the best student film at the Leo's. And I also applied for crazy eights multiple times and have never gotten it. So it's just, you just have to figure out that whatever the thing is that is going to keep you going. Cause I, there's probably a number of things that I've won or that I've gotten that Lawrence hasn't gotten, but like, it's a, it's really, you get discouraged. It can be really discouraging. And, you know, particularly with the pandemic right now, where it's very cost prohibitive, like more so to make work or like it's a health risk to make work. Um, I, I, I don't know how you like persevere or keep going. Like I took a job on a Netflix show because I wanted to work with people before the pandemic. And thankfully they didn't get canceled because of the pandemic. Um, and hopefully they'll hire me to direct their next show, but like, it's, you gotta be malleable. You gotta be flexible. Um, cause there will always be challenges. Steven Spielberg still has challenges. George Lucas still has challenges. Zack Snyder still has challenges. Um, (laughs) like nobody's giving them $250 million for their dream project that they want to make. Um, they're making, you know franchises um so yeah there you go rant done (laughs) (laughs) it was a good rant there's a lot of advice in there good advice uh zoran challenges um my challenge personal challenge uh, leaving emily car was not not having enough business um sense uh, because you, you get out in the real world and there's contracts um, just like even even if you're doing a video for some someone if it's a, if it's a pay gig and we talked about earlier about pay gigs business side of it just like how you do you negotiate your price how they pay you and in, in what terms so delivery uh, and then later other stuff so that was that was a kind of a a wake-up call for me and uh, I was fortunate I did not have an internship, but I I, 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 I developed a close relationship with a, a LA-based producer who moved to Vancouver and he was doing all the shows. And I think he saw my uh, interest in learning things. And so like uh, I was shadowing him and learning. And then he was also, um, I was gauging to see how, how on what frequency I can ask in questions that I needed. Uh, NDAs, which are really important for if you're sharing your creative content or uh, um, um, uh, intellectual pro- IP, uh, intellectual property, because somebody can just easily take, and I've, and I've experienced that, not on, on my behalf, but on, on a few other colleagues of mine whose ideas were taken and somebody else developed them into, a, into the project. So that, that's the thing is like that, that I, 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 I was not struggling, but I was learning and, 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 and trying to learn more, more of, and, 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 and just like, as I, as I was like uh, uh, tuning in my creative skills and, and, and stuff. Okay. Um, Ivan. Well, uh, it's sad to say that I'm still maintaining a lot of uh, challenges at this point uh, yeah. for my personal work. A lot of uh, and learning how to brace with rejection is something very common and very uh, normal. Uh, still going back to my graduation film, I had for some reason I had never showed. Despite this film was, I I think it's uh, based on a lot of North American humor, uh, in, like uh, North American, you know, more contemporary. Uh, a situation for some reason it had never been shown in uh despite i've submitted it to to a lot of festival it had never been shown in america 
before. Even in Vancouver, these screenings are pretty uh, limited as well. Um, for some reason, the main the main screening area is is uh, in Europe. And uh, yeah, I'm still dealing with a lot of rejection, so that's extremely normal. And the one piece of or the biggest challenge at the same time is also to be uh, as open minded as you uh, as you can. When I was an animation student, I've noticed a lot of my peers are uh, when they are at a course selection or basically career selection, they tend to be very technical specific. And for me, as much as I understand the reason why, because you know, getting a job it's the most stable way to make a stable income. You know, you got to work on the industry, but at the same time. Uh, I also wanted to take advantage at the student, uh, student, the learning stage to 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 be more open minded at some something that, you know, on the complete other side of our, of our study. And when I was a student, I tried to take courses from the uh, visual art major or maybe just basically anything, uh, you know, performance art. I tried to incorporate some performance art into my into my my personal work and maybe even now as well. So. Yeah, I mean, be open-minded and to be ad adaptive and to listen to listen or maybe uh, absorb knowledge from places that you you never expected before. This is really important. Right. I'm looking at the time and I'm mindful of it. Uh, we're at six twenty-one. Um, got a couple more questions here, and then I we we were thinking because we actually don't have a large turnout. So maybe instead of doing breakout rooms, we'll just unmute everyone's mics at the end and we can just kind of have open, we can just, how does everyone feel about that? Is that okay? Cool, excellent. Okay, um, so uh, Cheyenne, do you wanna tell us about some of the biggest challenges that you've had or a big, or, and how you overcame them? Yeah, um, I guess mine is really similar to other people's, I think. Um, not everyone is going to like your work you know we're all different human beings we come from all different kinds of experiences so I think just continue to submit continue to put your work out there and there will be someone who likes it and um that'll open doors for you so yeah okay <laughs> thanks um I'm also curious um I uh, Brian, um, do you still engage in like peer or community kind of critique and style feedback uh, that you would have received in university? Do you, do you still engage with that with your peers? Yeah, and for sure. How has that affected your practice? Um, well, so making, making comedy, one of the great things is that if you watch it with somebody, you know whether it's funny. Yeah. Like, you know, whether the jokes you wrote are funny because you can hear people laughing or with horror films, like you'll hear people scream or gasp or whatever. So that's like, I really value showing my work to people in person um, because that also ups the stakes other than sending somebody um, a, a, URL, a URL link um, for them to watch it on their own because yeah. you don't you don't get to take on those like fresh eyes, especially if you're editing your own work, you've seen it a thousand times. And for me, the, like, there's always a point where I go, this totally sucks and it's not funny anymore. And um, I have no idea. Um, so do you and get friends to, to do that with you or, peer, or peers? Uh, friends, like for me, like I'll probably get a few people who are not in the industry to look at it, but they're generally not going to give me um, some of the specific advice that I might be needing, like they might be able to say, oh, I didn't like, who was that to this person? I didn't understand that. So like, that's very valuable feedback. Um, but they're not going to be able to say, Hey, do you have a close up for that shot? Because that will be funnier and it will make the joke land better yeah. or take six frames off of this shot because that will land better or the continuity is really bothering me on this. Um, and so you have to figure out like, just, you know, you have to show your work to people and then along the way, you're going to figure out who are the best people to do that. Um, and like Ivan just said, like about keeping an open mind, those people might come from places that you don't expect. Um, it might be from an animator friend or a doc friend or, um, who knows, um, but I tried to recreate that experience during the pandemic because I was finishing a short film and we couldn't watch it all together. So I did a Zoom call where I 
can't remember if I just sent everybody the same link and everybody muted themselves, but I was like watching their faces, watch my short. Um, and that was kind of funny, but it was a great experience. And like, it's very worthwhile um, because people are going to see things that you don't or hadn't thought of. That's great. Zoran, do you still uh, participate in uh, peer community critique style feedback? Yes. Yes, um, I think that's important. That's uh, that's a skill set that we we learn early on at Emily Carr, and that's that's the thing that sets us apart from anybody else. Uh, I can't stress that as well because um, um, I think we at Emily Carr we we develop a different uh, approach to not just our own work but other people's work and what to see and and, and differentiate uh, and I've, I've, I had I had colleagues from different places like SFU or UBC and and, I, and 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 it's a different environment in which they hone that skill um, but it, it, that's that's a that's a thing I think it's it's more most valuable thing from Emily Carr it's just like how how you perceive it and then yeah, that's 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 one of my uh, one of my favorite um, things too. So well, I'm sure the faculty. I'll make sure that Christine hears that. She'll like that. <laughs> um, Lawrence, um, I uh, I think that um, basically I, I agree with a lot with what Brianne said. Um, I think it's important to like if you're writing a script to get a, as much feedback as you can from not just from anyone, you know, for people who can um, be honest and be constructive and critical, but also like give you the right kind of, like also for you to ask for the kind of feedback that you are looking for, like whether it be broad strokes or, you know, like, you know, uh, what have you, um, um, or if it's like very specific notes, um, it's just, it's just the process of improving, like when you, like as an editor, when you have like a assemble or a rough cut, you know, it's kind of like just getting, um, I, I feel like it, the, the process of refining and getting, testing the waters in terms of like an audience reaction is just like a part of um, uh, making the work better. Um, and, uh, having having those people like sort of like you know when you have those collaborators and you know friends in the field you have and having those people you can trust just when you develop those relationships i think it is sort of like you 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 have this sort of engagement with them you you like you give them feedback for their work and you you have you can do the same with them um and it's great to have those people that you trust with work that you may not, you know, like maybe afraid to show somebody like, oh, I don't know if this is like terrible or if this is like any good, you know, having someone that you feel comfortable being vulnerable with um, is important. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, Cheyenne? Yeah, I, I come from like a family of artists, which is really nice. So my mom's a singer songwriter my brother um, owns like a fashion line. Uh, so I actually usually go to them for advice um, as well as like my friends. Yeah. Like I have a lot of friends that have graduated from Emily Carr that I'm still very close to. And um, yeah, that, that helps a lot as well. Uh, yeah. And mentors also, you mentioned that. Yeah. You have yeah. I think that, that, no. as well like the past year I think having someone who has like such a high expertise in like what I'm working through um has helped a lot like I would just send the works as I produce them and then we would just kind of talk about them th through together and um sh Rebecca Belmar actually came to my BMO um show at uh in Toronto and oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was really nice. Like oh, they couldn't display all four um, videos because it was like a, a room, right? It was like too much space to take up. So it was just like the one screen. Um, but basically my, my work was like I projected the video onto this sheer fabric that I'm wearing in the performance. So it creates like a double layer on the sheer fabric and then onto the wall. Um, 
so they just kind of displayed all four videos on that one um, sheer fabric. Um, but when Rebecca came in and saw it, it was the first time she actually saw the installation portion of it. And um, she turned to me and she said, you don't need me. <laughs> and I died. <laughs> and I almost died. Yeah, it was really nice. So yeah, mentors are really lovely. That's great. Ivan. Uh, yeah, I'm still looking for mentors. Uh, unfortunately, most of my work made before was kind of uh, kind of within uh, personal, but I, I've shown it to a couple of my uh, my my peers, close friend, and they've give they've certainly given my uh, some advice. And uh, yeah, my my parents are my harshest critic. Uh, usually, <laughs> uh, particularly my dad has some. They keep on asking me what what are you what are you doing? What's the point of doing that? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean finding Uranus? What does that mean? Like, <laughs> what's up with that? Anyhow, yeah. So a lot of time, I I, I tend to give it to to yeah. But 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 occasionally he does have some pretty uh, valuable insight uh, uh, towards my towards my work as well. Not not specifically to this film, but uh yeah. I mean, in a way, he in a way because he is he is and he represents what the outsider think about uh you know work so I do think that going through them uh, are relatively important. Okay do you ever show your work to any colleagues or people that you work with or do you share and get feedback from them rather than just your dad? <laughs> so, uh, definitely. <laughs> the, the thing is that uh, the um, industry visual effect uh, artists are very technical leaning so when they have a chance to make uh, a short film which is happening all the time uh, they their work is also based on uh, you know, narrative or visual style wise, it's very industry oriented. So it looks well, really well made. It's like watching an amazing uh, short, uh, uh, short film that was, uh, that you can tell that they, they have a feature film in mind and you know, mm. all the technical aspects are in. And then suddenly you, 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 I was jumping in and I kind of, kind of scared them a little bit. But yeah, occasionally I do receive some very unexpected feedback from 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 some of my coworkers or friends from coworkers who actually found me on LinkedIn, they 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 emailed me and said, "Hey, uh, I just saw your film in a in a screening. No one really expected, you know, what we, what we are what we are about to watch, and definitely got us out of blue. So those are fun. That's great. Okay, um, so um, I was gonna add that um, you asking like like Lauren said, like getting people to read your script. That's another really excellent opportunity to network is when you are trying to get the film made um, and like talking to, pro if you're gonna go to festivals or galleries like Cheyenne is going to, if you talk to those people who are programming those things um, and you might say, hey, I attended your festival or I was programmed at your festival and I have this new work and I'm wondering what you think of it, which is also getting feedback on your short, but you're also reminding people that you exist and then getting them involved with your next project which is part of building your audience um and like something we haven't talked about at all right now is like online presence and social media but that's a huge thing that people are doing to try and make films is like crowdfunding and crowd financing and letting people know what you're working on as a way to do that i find it very daunting and overwhelming crowdfunding um but it's definitely you know kill two birds one stone does anyone want to jump in on that because actually that's a great topic it's not i've got something a little bit the next question kind of goes with that but uh so the next question is what are some good resources um professional affiliations or social media sites to um uh for people to follow or or use when starting out so real early career stuff that's uh, good advice. I mean, I would definitely use any and all websites that you can to do your homework, like do your research on either festivals you're trying to get, grants you're trying to get, like what have they previously funded? Or even whenever I apply for a film festival, I always try to find out who a programmer is, find something that is a connection between us and then email them and say, hey, I'm, I've already submitted this film or I'm about to submit this film or can I have a fee waiver? But I start it with like a compliment about something that is specific to them. Um, and so whether that's LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram, whatever I can find from that person. Um, 
And if I, if I know somebody who knows them, like that's what social networks are for is it says, oh, you know, 10 people who know this person, ask those 10 people that, you know, to introduce you to that person that you want to meet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Podcasts are really great these days because sometimes uh, people open up and they talk about their way making and getting their work out there. So um, investing maybe like 20, 20, 30 minutes, just listening to a podcast. Which podcast? uh, There are different, uh, like, I mean, podcasts are like all personal preference. And, and, you know, some, some, some like are really like, uh, for example, um, in indie film podcasts, um, if, if, I mean, the, the, the another way is like keeping in touch. So if somebody wants to contact me, I, I can I can send them a, a resource list of, of podcasts that I personally listen when I have time. Or if there's a specific guest that I follow and I want to know more. Um, um, that, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, what's really great is with Alumni Association uh, to keep in touch with other alumni uh, such as myself or Lawrence or, or e, Ivan and, and, and whoever else. And then if they can help out or if you have a question, you can you know, uh, post a question. There's, there's a, a ways to communicate and, and that, you know, that, that's also uh, resourceful. And, uh, and, and um, if, if I can personally help, I'll, I'll gladly do it. So. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Lauren. I think, I think um, like gen- generally speaking, like having like even just having your work, like having a website, having, um, you know, like your, your demo reel or your, your shorts or your work on a site in, in, a, in a way that is speaks to you, like has, presents you in the, in, in the way that you want to be presented and um, having, you know, your social media presence kind of uh, like, I think that's like a basic like like a general like good practice just to if I if I wanted to look you up I could and see everything that you're about and read up on you um but also like I I uh like in getting your work out there I think there's also like for a short example uh, for, for using a short as an example like um I think like there are many like obvi- there's like you know the platform like what i even got onto like for, for uh finding uranus with the uh, short of the week and like vimeo staff pick and you know those are like really great sites to be on but i've also seen um and like you know cool like you, you like boom or nowness but I, I think also like depending on the subject of your film if you if you can find the audience like if you're if it's like um uh feminist centric for example like it gets on Ref- uh, refinery 29 or something or like there's uh like sort of the different platforms that can really uh connect your work to uh, and to like you know this the audience that would resonate with it most um and um i realized that uh Another thing, like we something with press, like you know, having a relationship with journalists or like knowing who those folks are, and even reaching out and saying, like, you know, like um, doesn't doesn't hurt to try to create those like opportunities for them to write about your work, um, and also like f- like for my own project, I'm because it's kind of around about Chinatown. And it's about in sort of in the world of Asian rap I've been kind of trying to connect with those folks uh just on a just like be in their social media bubble um and just see what they're posting and engage with them online and um actually like engage with the community that that community that will would be like a good audience for the work that I'm making um so those are just some some thoughts like kind of something that feels something that's like thoughtful you know I think I feel like the the work is one thing and then like the getting the work out there is like it's its own thing you know it's like almost like a piece of it's like it's a it's like a campaign it's like a but it's, it's like a it requires as much, almost as much thoughtfulness as 
the actual work sometimes. So uh, in the chat here, uh, both Zoran and Brianna have put in uh, some different podcasts that you might want to listen to students. So mm -hmm. you can check there and see those. Um, I'm going to get into the um, final question here. Um, or, you know, sorry, I missed Ivan and I missed you, Cheyenne. So Ivan, do you have any uh, anything that you would re uh, recommend such as good resources, professional affiliations or social media sites for people starting out? I think what Lawrence and uh, Brienne and, and Zora and just, just shared pretty good insight. I don't think I have, I have anything to anything add for to now. Anything to add? Yeah. Okay, how about you, Cheyenne? Um, just one specific thing um, that has been initiated in Edmonton is making space on Instagram. It's making space dot yeg. Um, it's specifically for BIPOC people, um, which for me as well, it's like really nice for me to engage with like indigenous community when I'm making work um, about my identity. So this is a specific, um, it's like a peer it's a BIPOC peer mentorship. So it's run through Slack. Um, you can message them and they'll add you to the Slack, but there's people all across the world, New York, and they just like, they're all sharing links, sharing like call outs. Um, there's workshops they put on. It's really lovely space. That's uh, great. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we'll definitely uh, share that with students as well. Um, okay. So, um, like, yeah. The way Ivan, the way Ivan promoted his, his short fit fruit, just like, it makes me want to watch it. He just posted like random pictures of like celebrities with fruit and like Morgan <laughs> Freeman with fruit or like, I forget the other ones, but that's like, it. see that I, it makes me want to watch this film. I don't even know what it's about, but I want to watch it. So it's unique promotion there. Hey, so do you feel like there's anything uh, that we've missed then that you'd like to touch on? Um, actually, I, I might like like to add just um, one more thing. I, I think I'm talking about, it was the thing we were talking about struggle. Uh, one thing we were struggling with and just wanted to add that um, uh, like, I guess there's a kind of conversation about money and, and lifestyle and finding balance with, you know, like, if you're doing work at a at a studio or working for a new a union show or working on set i think it's really easy to like i find like the the better something like this all isn't always a case but speaking generally it's like when the money's better it's like sometimes it's, in vancouver at least even like sometimes in the animation industry or the vfx industry um it's like sometimes it seems like when it's easy to get into work, uh, working for other people. Um, and it feels nice to make money, but sometimes it's hard to make space for yourself and make that time to create your own work and not be making money. And uh, it's always, a, I think that's like always a struggle, even like doing, or even like doing work that you, that you really enjoy or find value align like working on Ying's film like that was a self-finance and uh so but there wasn't like a, a whole lot of money there and you know I kind of balance that with like taking a, a, a you know doing a gig that I'm less invested in for example like you know uh for to you know balance, get some make some money um but yeah it's always you know tough with balancing um just making time for yourself. And I think it's always important to do that. Uh, even like, like, but, and also I know folks who like do work for a, uh, VFX companies or for working for the studio system or on set. And it's like, it takes up a lot of energy and it's just, uh, but you know, folks still do make that time to do their own thing. And I think it's, it's just important to make that space for yourself. Okay. My agent, one of the, the owner of the agency that I'm at, he has this philosophy, um, where all the jobs that you take should have two out of three um like a venn diagram like two two at least two things that overlap so cash career or um passion 
So if you're going to take a cash job, is it somehow going to help your career? Like if I go to work on the Netflix show that just shot here, how is that going to help my career? Well, for me, I was working with the cinematographer, the director and the producer. So that's great for career, but it's also going to help me make my next film because I made friends with a bunch of the people that were working on that. Then they wanted to see my short. When they saw my short, they were like, whatever you're doing next, I want to help you on it. So that's going to save me cash the next thing I do, because I'm going to hire the best like technical crew, hire, ask for a favor, or maybe hire the, the crew who make the best films and the best shows or tier one come out and help me for a day or two to make my next sample or whatever it's going to be so definitely like if you have passion and you want to make your own shows like getting into working as career you can definitely or getting into working as crew for cash um that can trap you but it can also like help create your own opportunities which you also mentioned earlier Lawrence is that you can turn that into another opportunity that's great advice. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, there. Somebody just asked me a question in the chat, but whenever uh, I can answer that, no, whenever well, is uh, appropriate. Uh, yeah, Brian, uh, are you allowed to tell us what show you're working on now? <laughs> Well, I just, so the show that I just finished, it's a limited um, series. So it's going to be seven episodes. It's called Midnight Mass. And it's the new series from Mike Flanagan. He's the writer creator of um, The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor, which were both on Netflix. Um, and he directed Dr. Sleep, which was the sequel to The Shining. Um, and then he's got a new show coming up. Uh, which is filming in Vancouver and they just announced the cast. It's based on a Christopher Pike novel called Midnight Club. Um, well, okay, well, I'm thinking, uh, how does everyone feel about if we unmute and uh, we can just, you can ask, we can ask questions. 